Well, hey there! This is Zobivore, not Zobivore, and uh, welcome to Zob's Projects, the series in which I talk about ridiculous things that interest me, and you're all along for the ride. So I, I know that I, I said that uh, this series was going to have really low production values. Um, we're just no, not going to do any edits. Um, just gonna just vomit the whole video out in one take and then just upload it and then just be done with it because you know people on the internet love things that are unpolished and unprofessional and then I got to thinking and I said to myself you know what the these the, the last video was actually missing you know what it was really missing I don't know like it kind of adds to the ambiance a little bit doesn't it like like I'm not even talking, and like there's still sound. So like I could just I could just shut up. We could just listen to the music. No, I won't do that. That would be stupid. But um, yeah, it's just public domain stuff that I just you know got off the internet. Better than nothing. Um, and you know this is only uh, season one, so we have kind of a limited sound library. You might hear the same music tracks more than once over the next year, but we'll just you know it's just like the old Transformers cartoon. It it'll be fine. Okay, so um, I collect toys based on characters from my favorite media. If it doesn't exist, then I build it myself. I'm going to say that in every video. <clears throat> in addition to collecting tons of toys, um, I also have built lots of toys, over, over 500. And here's some of my PVC figures, and some of these are official uh, Takara SCF or Heroes of Cybertron figurines, but a lot of these are ones that I painted. Um, I've done some Transformers projects. Most of this is stuff that I've painted. There's a few things that are retail, but we just won't talk about those. Here's some of my Ninja Turtles projects. This is the first time any of this stuff has ever appeared on video. Now this is um, my pride and joy. This is a, um, I stopped working on everything else. Ninja Turtles, Transformers, Star Wars, so I could focus on Final Fantasy. But, no, no, don't look at that yet. Before we get to that, let's talk about these guys. So Final Fantasy II as it was known um, in America. Yeah. I realize it's actually Final Fantasy IV. Um, it took me a long time to actually start calling it Final Fantasy IV. But back in the day, when it was released in 1991 for the Super Nintendo, it was Final Fantasy II. And I loved the game. I'm not going to say that it changed my life, but I'm not going to deny that it basically changed my life. Um, the storyline was amazing. The, uh, the music was incredible. The characters were so captivating. And I wanted to build action figures based on these characters because no one had ever really released any. Now, what happened was after I built all the heroes, and it took me a few years to get to all these guys, but I did I did figures of all the playable characters. And then I, th I got to thinking, you know what would be really cool is if I did like a monster. So I did like one monster. I figured, you know what? You know who would be really iconic would be the, the float eye. The first uh, monster that Cecil encounters in one of the the cutscenes at the beginning of the game. And I got this crazy idea in my head, and I said to myself, what would it be like if I spent some time and just just went all out and just built like 200 monsters, 200 of the enemies, all 200 of the enemies from Final Fantasy 2, 4, Final Fantasy 4. What you're seeing on this bookshelf right here, this is about two years worth of work, um, averaging about one series or one group of projects every month. So just for example, the the soldiers here, I was able to do those in a month. The the EP girl and Carrie, I was able to do in about a month. By the way, I use the original SNES names for these monsters. I know that in various remakes, um, they've gotten better names, but I don't care. Um, I grew up with their original names, and so to me, this will always be Talantla. Interesting thing about the enemies from this game is a lot of the common enemies are pretty uh, pretty standard uh, monsters you might find in folklore or mythology, but um, the bosses are usually original creations, like this guy. He doesn't exist anywhere else. He's the evil mask. Um, he was a lot more difficult to build because unlike, you know, these birds, which you can just get off the shelf at Target and paint, or these dragons, which you can you know buy at Hobby Lobby and just slap a coat of paint on them. This was this didn't exist anywhere, so I had to it took a while. Um, but I just kind of wanted to give you guys kind of a, a preview. Okay, I 
I'm trying to collect one of every G1 Transformers toy released in America. This is the part of our show where you get to watch me open my new acquisitions in real time. There, I said it. And here's something I should probably confess. So I... <clears throat> We're recording some segments out of order. I know I said I was not going to do any editing. I was just going to film it and be done with it. But here's the thing is um, I actually got a couple of packages like a few days ago and I opened them. And then after I opened them, I thought to myself, oh, unboxing videos, that would be cool. And then I thought about like, you know, stuffing the toys back in the box and like I actually dug through the garbage and got the mailing label and I was thinking about taping the mailing label back on and like putting the you know the crumpled up newspapers back inside the box and I'm like you know what well I'll just film it because I don't have any new you know mail to open I'll just film it and I'll uh I'll pretend to be surprised by what's inside and then I thought no that's really disingenuous let's not lie because as we all know everything on the internet is 100% true but then it's okay because now I've gotten more packages. But I had to wait. I got this in the mail this morning at 9 o'clock and I've had... What time is it now? It's almost 6. This has been sitting on my computer desk for hours and I haven't been able to open it because I'm like, no, I have to save it for the unboxing video. It's been driving me crazy. I'm really excited to open this though. Because yes, as I said, I've been doing a lot of eBaying so I don't actually know what's in here. Um, I have a couple of ideas. I'm not going to spoil it. I'm just going to open it and we're just going to, you, you can, you get to see me for the first time cutting myself open with an X-Acto knife. No, I'm actually really careful with these. More crumpled up newspaper, you know. Bubble wrap's expensive. Newspaper is cheap. Oh, there's a thing in here. This feels heavy. Oh man, this is exciting. This is like Christmas almost. Okay, I saw the foot. Okay. If you guys can tell what toy this is just based on this, then you got, you, you're clearly as as big of a Transformers fan as I am. It's chrome dome! So this is great. So here's the thing. Just make sure there's no other pieces in there. Okay. So I actually did own a headless chrome dome uh, a long time ago, back in 1987. And so I just had this stupid ass chrome dome with no head and no guns for years. And then I finally sold it. Uh, you know, for probably like six dollars or something like that, some insanely low price. It was, it was, yeah. But I haven't handled this toy in a really long time, and um, so I've I've been spending a non-zero amount of money trying to rebuild my G1 collection. So I looked at a lot of different chrome domes. There were some where the paint was chipped off right here. There were some where the, where the window had a lot of bad scratches in it. There were some where the the stickers were really bad. Um, but this was the one that I liked the most out of all the ones that I saw and I'm handling him with kid gloves just because like I don't Wouldn't it be the worst thing ever if like I got this in the mail and then I tried to transform it and then I broke it like that would be I Don't know. I guess you'd get to see me cry this this is what I used to own I used to have a, a, a headless body and you know you could put other headmaster heads on it But it's not you know, it's not the same thing as actually having, you know, Mr. Stylor Man Ray here, because that's great. And you see, I never realized that the red on Stylor doesn't actually quite match the red on Chrome Dome. But a lot of the original Headmasters are like that, where the head is completely different colors than the body. I think it's, I think it was a way of Hasbro pretending like, well, look, this isn't original factory components. See, this is different because this gray is not found anywhere on him, and this shade of red is not found anywhere on him, because this, had its origins from, you know, Nebulos. And this had its origins from Planet Cybertron. I really think that was the reason why. And we got his guns. Because two guns are better than one. They're twice the fun. Ask anyone. This is great. This is re this. It delights me to hold this in my hand. Like, I'm really happy about this. So here is, here is Stylor. Looking very much like he looks. Like, that's, that's a familiar, I've, I've never owned this before. But the design is pretty familiar to me, just from his appearance in like Marvel Comics and like the cartoon. And then when you um, when you transform him, this little forehead panel, this isn't in the instructions. I discovered this as a kid on one rainy day, and I rushed over to my neighbor kid's uh, neighbor neighbor friend's house to tell him about this because I was so excited to discover that these flipped over because the instructions don't actually tell you about that. Um, I'm sure everybody knows about it now, and I'm I'm really hesitant to pose his arms just because this is made of really like brittle 30 year old plastic. I don't want to. The, the arm pegs did tend to snap off. His stickers are reasonably good. I actually did 
buy some uh, Chrome Dome stickers from an eBay seller named Wormy Worms, which I'm pretty sure is the guys at, at ToyHacks.com. I'm pretty sure it's Delta Star, but I could be wrong. Um, so the factory stickers actually look pretty good. The consumer applied stickers may be a little, you know, they're kind of falling apart down here, but that's okay because I've got new stickers coming. And then he will be worthy of being on the, uh, the display back here. Oh, this is great though. He looks really good. And I'm so happy to own like a complete chrome dome. Um, I spent, I think, close to, uh, around $100. I think I best spent about 100 on him. It's a lot of money, but I mean, this this really, this fills me with joy. I'm so happy right now. Like, you have no idea. I just have like this warm feeling right in the middle of my heart. And remember, if you sell me a transformer on eBay, it might just make an appearance on this channel. It's from the script. I'm, I'm gonna say that every time. It's part of the brand. And so just move some guys over. Chrome Dome. You guys get to see him joining the ranks of his compatriots for the first time, and that's where he's gonna live. So I write these terrible amateur fantasy novels. Uh, they're called the Butterfly Princess series. Uh, they're written by me, David Graham Edwards, and um, I've self-published them on Amazon. I just wanted to do like an overview of the series and kind of explain what it is and how it came to be and um, like how it all started, really. Um, so I was uh, I was courting my wife back in uh, approximately 2005 and. Um, I was madly in love with her, I was enamored by her, I was inspired by her, I was captivated by her, and I just, I don't know what compelled me to, to want to do this, but I just wanted to make this drawing that kind of encompassed uh, how I felt. And I, I, for, I was envisioning this this character, this, this, this beautiful woman with butterfly wings, colorful butterfly wings, just like leaping off a cliff. To her death. No, no, because she she can fly. She's got wings. Just leaping into into the unknown and into freedom. And it was just it, it was a good good feeling, you know. Like it, it's a good feeling to have. And so, I did this illustration, and I I didn't even know who she was. Like I called the the picture the butterfly princess because she didn't have a name. And um, of course she loved it, and she hung it on her wall. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool if like I did another one, like you know next year. And I kind of expanded on on the concept, and I'm like, well, if there is one butterfly person, there must be a race of butterfly people. And so the next illustration I did, they were just like in their butterfly, their hidden butterfly forests, of course, nobody knows where it is. And they're just like having a butterfly dance. The illustration was actually called the butterfly dance. Um, and you got your butterfly drummer and your old man butterfly and your baby caterpillar butterfly. And it was just the whole butterfly civilization, just a whole colony, and it was cool. Um, and then, it kind of became a thing, and I started doing an illustration every year. And as I um, as I created this, I kind of like envisioned like their whole imaginary world in my head, just kind of adding to the lore. And I'm like, um, so I did one where like she's peering into a tree, peering into a hollow tree, and there's these little pixies that are uh, crafting this weapon, uh, presumably for her. Um, and it was just kind of a neat look into sort of, sort of a Keebler elf type scenario and of course well that begs the question why does she need a weapon and then so the following year there was a I called it rite of passage was the name of the illustration and she's fighting this tremendous uh, I called it a, a dragon beetle just like a giant uh, potato bug almost um, and you know each each illustration kind of uh, lent itself to new questions. Well, why is she fighting this potato bug? Why is she risking her life? And then, you know, come to find out um, she's protecting her little caterpillar baby. Um, and it's, it's kind of interesting because some of these illustrations, because I mean, by this point I had done several illustrations. I'd been with my wife for several years. And in a way, the illustrations were sort of representative of what was going on in her life at the time. Because, like, when she was fighting the dragon beetle, um, she had a lot of responsibilities. She was doing things with the PTA and the, the condo association. And just she had a lot of responsibilities. So, that, in a way, that kind of encompassed how she felt at that particular moment in her life. And then, of course, uh, when, when she and I had a, our first child together, um, that, you know, translated, I guess, to the, the caterpillar baby. Um... And by this point, I was fully immersed in the lore. I'm like, okay, there's stuff going on here that we don't even know about yet. 
By the way, she's sitting on a tree stump, but interestingly, I don't think that the peaceful butterfly people would really chop down a tree. So like if she's sitting on a tree stump, who who cut down the tree? And so the next illustration was, um, uh, I, I called it Blizzard Ambush, and it, she's fighting, now there's moth people. She's fighting the moth people. The moth people cut down the tree. She's, and by this point, the caterpillar baby is a little bit older. You know, he's like a tech caterpillar, or a butterfly toddler, and he's got his own little weapon, and he's, he's helping fight. And so, um, at one point, my wife said to me, you know, there's so much lore behind these illustrations, and she was proud of them. She would show them all. She'd invite people up to the bedroom, and because we've got them up on the wall above our bed, you know, because she she's she frames every one of them and hangs them. And uh, just kidding, I buy the frames, but she hangs them. No, I actually, I, I hang them myself, but she wants me to hang them. <laughs> anyway, um, so she, she said at one point, you know, you could write like a whole book. You've got enough material here to write a whole book. And I'm like, hmm, it's kind of interesting. I kind of do, don't I? And so um, I had written stories before, you know, fan fiction and whatnot. Um, but I'd never really written like an original novel and I didn't know if I could really pull it off and I'm like how do I even how does one even go about writing a novel and I'm like well okay so I've got my main character I've got my butterfly princess she probably needs a name um but I mean you know it, it just kind of it kind of went from there like I had to um I had to create a love interest for her and I had to create some some conflict you know because every good story has conflict um and I don't. We're not going to go into too much detail about the first book right now. I just want kind of wanted to give you an overview of like even where the idea came from and like how I started writing. Um, and when I wrote the, uh, I called it a butterfly's tale. That was the name of the book. Um, and I can't believe I actually managed because I was I was doing research on well how long is a novel and the guideline was around seventy thousand words. And I overshot that and then ended up being like closer to 90,000 words. But I, I had written a novel and it was pretty cool. So this was in, in 2011 that I first, uh, finished the first book. Um, and I was able to actually format it for uh, for Kindle so she could read it on her ebook. And it was kind of cool because like I kind of felt like a novelist in a way, you know? Like I felt like I'd accomplished something. Um, and then one of the illustrations that I had done uh, actually became the, the front cover. For the book, for what ended up being the first book. Um, and after I finished the first book, I realized, you know what, I've got more story to tell. Um, so I've done. There's been a few of them. And for those of you who are aspiring writers, I'm obviously not an expert. Um, I'm not the, the the authority here. But in my opinion, um, there's no such thing as writer's block. I feel like that's a huge stumbling block for uh, for for authors, especially beginning authors. But I mean. Just keep in mind, if you think you're stuck, then guess what? You're right. If you think you can write a book, then you're also right. Thank you for watching my videos. Uh, I know that your time is valuable and I appreciate that you chose me. If you click the like button, it tells me that you watched the video and enjoyed it. If you click that uh, big obnoxious Z with the exclamation point, then uh, that's how you subscribe. And if you uh, leave rude remarks in the comments, and that tells me you're a big jerk. I will see you all here next week.